Alhamdulillah, we take the opportunity to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us the ability to be in the masjid on the day of Jumu'ah. There are many of our brothers that cannot be with us here today. There are those that are not with us anymore. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant them the highest stages of Jannah. And there are those that are occupied or stuck elsewhere. Other people are in hospital, they are ill. Alhamdulillah, we make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can keep them with afin, grant them shifa. Amen. We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving shifa to Imam Hassan also. Amen. Uh, Alhamdulillah. And we make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can grant him good health and better health, inshallah, going forward. We continue with strength for all. Amen. So Alhamdulillah, we continue with our discussion as we have been over the past couple of weeks. And again, an opportunity that we take to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us the ability to study this particular kitab. And for those that do not know the book that we are doing currently, it is the uh, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and in seven cabin, which was the book uh, that was authored by Sayyid Muhammad bin Alabi al-Maliki al-Hasani rahimahullah ta'ala. Very, very great scholar from Mecca. He passed away and he authored this beautiful book of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, everything pertaining to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And there are very, very beautiful lessons in this book, very, very beautiful things about the various aspects of the character and the various aspects of the personality and the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that we're not necessarily going to find in general books. You know, you might find a small little kitab discussing uh, the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But there are many, many aspects of the interaction of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam with the Sahaba radiallahu anhu, interactions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam with his wives radiallahu anhu, that you are not just going to find in general kitabs. So alhamdulillah, we are continuing with the topic of discussion that we have been uh, for the past two Jumas. This will be the third Jumaat that we continue this topic. And we were speaking about the eloquence of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There was one very, very beautiful hadith, which I would like to repeat for the benefit of those that were not here uh, that particular week. But the hadith that we discussed was a hadith in which Abbas sallallahu alayhi wa came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said, Ya Rasulullah, what makes a man beautiful? And the response that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave to Abbas sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the eloquence of his tongue. That if you can beautify your speech, automatically you will become a beautiful person. When someone is rude, when someone is uh, vulgar, we generally don't like to associate with those individuals. We will not like to be known that so and so normally hangs out with that person. Because vulgarity has never been seen as a good quality. To be rude, to be you know, uh, rash, to be obnoxious, these are not qualities, these are not... Uh, actions which are associated with goodness and they are not things which should be associated with a believer nor should a believer associate himself with these things. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us tawfiq and understanding. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told Abbas radiallahu anhu that the eloquence of his tongue, this will make a person beautiful. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made a dua and he said that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon the individual that rectifies his tongue. And then we also explain various aspects of the tongue. Rectification of the tongue, we are predominantly focusing on the beauty of speech and the fact that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was jawadi'un kalim as we said, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed him with comprehensive speech to the extent where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would use a few words but contained in those words would be an ocean of knowledge. An ocean of, of ma'na, meaning, uh, beautiful lessons that would come out of that one sentence of the Prophet So eloquence of speech, beautiful speech, correct speech is there in its place, but rectification of the tongue, that what am I using my tongue for? Is my tongue being used in the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So again, correct my tongue. Is my speech correct? Am I using vulgar speech? Is vulgarity part of my day? Am I comfortable with insulting people? Am I comfortable with scolding people? Am I comfortable with swearing at people? You know, when the Uber drivers, may Allah bless them, when they drive 40 kilometers an hour in the 120 zone, and it's very difficult for us to overtake. Some people have a very low patience, very low tolerance threshold. So what are the words that we use when we drive past and look at them very sternly? Yeah, I knew it was an Uber driver, I knew it. And we hoot at him. 
and we use a bunch of words that we will regret on the day of Qiyamah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us tawfiq and understanding. And may Allah grant us patience when we need it. So like this rectification of the tongue, to fix your tongue, fix your speech. Am I vulgar? If I am, I need to work on it. This is why we are doing this kitab of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We need to implement and practice what we are learning. Do I backbite? Am I comfortable with the idea and the concept of speaking ill of people behind their backs? If I am, which is very common, brothers and sisters in Islam, backbiting is also sometimes very subtle. You may start a conversation with all sincerity. I'm concerned about so and so. You know, this is what happened the other day. It's bothering me. What should I do? And then the conversation starts. And this is where Shaitan comes in. Hey, you know what? But I also saw so and so doing this action. Can you believe it? And you would have thought that because he did this and this and this, or because he comes from this family. And did you know you went to go and study even? SubhanAllah. He's supposed to be learned, but he's doing X, Y, and Z. And then all the riba starts coming in. And all our good deeds are going out. Yeah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. All of this comes from the tongue. So when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, May Allah have mercy upon the individual who can rectify his tongue. We need to understand the depth of that one statement of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we continued in our previous Jumu'ah when we spoke about certain ahadith which have been recorded. And again, as I said, I apologize. I only have the English copy of this book. Um, it's imported, in fact. It's not even locally found. Um, but we have the English translation in front of us, alhamdulillah. So we will discuss these ahadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in English and obviously this is the language which is closest to most of us. Uh, so to our benefit, we will continue with the ahadith that we have discussed uh, going forward. So last week or the previous week we touched on the hadith, the last one that we discussed was that gatherings are bonds of trust. And I expounded on this hadith in a different aspect, from a different light. Normally, al majalis will be a manner. A meeting, a gathering, a meeting is an amana. It is a trust that is given to the members of that meeting that we should protect the information that was shared or divulged within that gathering. In other words, it is not something which is supposed to be shared with the rest. Because if it was supposed to be shared with the rest, it would be public knowledge and they would all be present in that gathering. But they were not. So for the few individuals that were present in that gathering, that gathering is an amala for those people. The information, the, the, you know, whatever was shared, whatever was taught in that gathering, it is only for the members of that gathering. So we should understand this. Sometimes we have a very important meeting or we have a private meeting with someone. And we ask other people to please be excused. I need to share a few words with this brother. Or I need to share a few words with this sister. So we need everybody else to please excuse us for a few minutes. We need to speak in private. So now what happens is your friend that was maybe there afterwards, you'll nudge you and say, Amen. What's all the fuss? What's all of this about? For you to now go and divulge that information, you are breaking the trust. And you're obviously going against the teaching of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we spoke about this from the aspect of marriage. And I mentioned this. You can ask anybody that is in the field of counseling or somebody that works with, uh, with uh, couples that are going through a tough time. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect the Muslim marriages. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant afiyah to one and all. May Allah increase those that, have, that are married. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase the couples in compassion in love, in understanding, in respect for each other, in dutiful, you know, in their dutifulness to each other. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really just grant the Muslims the understanding of how to fulfill their duties correctly. So when you as a couple have an argument, or you even just have something that happens in private between the two of you, for you to go and speak about those things, outside of your marriage is the first thing, the first catalyst to destruction of that relationship. The moment you start speaking out of the if you go and mention, for example, if you go and speak about your wife, for example, may Allah protect us, but you speak about your wife 
to your family in a negative light, they will never look at her in a positive light thereafter. And if she must go to her parents or her family and speak about her husband in a negative light, he's a good for nothing, he's like this, X, Y, and Z, and all the adjectives that come out after that, and he doesn't know how to look after me, he's like this, he's like that. They will never be able to look at that man with respect again thereafter, because in the back of their mind, they will always have this, that this man is still treating my wife. Uh, sorry, he's still treating his wife. He's, he's, he's still treating his daughter. He's not, looking, uh, he's not looking after my daughter. He's not looking after his wife. He doesn't know how to be a good man, etc., etc. And then it starts. The first point is that, and then after all the other issues will come from there. And then one day when there's a big blow up, then everybody will get involved and everybody's fingers are going to be pointed at each other and everybody's mentioning all the stuff that was supposed to be private. All of those things come out in the arguments thereafter. And we have destroyed relationships across the board. So this is how shaitan does these things. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to understand when Allah says, shaitan is an open enemy to you, so take him as your enemy. Understand him to be your enemy. Don't just think that shaitan is one shaitan somewhere there. And oh no, I'm strong. He won't be able to get hold of me. Or he won't be able to get the better of me. I have control of myself. There were people that were far greater than us that got tricked by shaitan. There was one particular alim in the Bani Israel. It's mentioned in Sahih al-Bukhari. The incident, he used to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very, very dutifully. He never got married, nothing, for years and years and years, decades. He had a specific tower in which he would worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Shaitan wanted to take this man away. He wanted to take him off track. But he knew that I can't just go directly to this island. He's very strong in his worship. His yaqeen is strong. His ibadah is powerful. I can't just go and sway him. I need to think of a plan. I need to come up with some type of a scheme. So Shaitan decided, he looked in the village and there was a family. Two brothers and a sister. The sister was exceptionally beautiful. And the two brothers were the only remaining relatives of this woman. They needed to go on suffer. They did not trust anybody else in the village. So they went to the Abid. They went to knock on his door. He said, leave me alone, I'm busy. They said, please, we need to speak with you. He opens the door. How can I assist you? Brother, we are going on a journey. We have been away for many, many months. We don't trust anybody but you. You are a pious servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Please, can you help us just look after our sister? She will be alone. We don't need you to do just check on her from time to time to see if she's okay. So the man agreed. The two brothers went on their journey. And as promised, the Abid came down from his tower and he went to the house. Initially what he used to do, he just used to knock on the door. The sister would open the door just a small bit. Salam alaikum wa alaikum salam. Is everything okay? Yes, I'm fine. Okay, salam alaikum. And he goes. This would carry on for a couple of weeks. Eventually, the crack of the door started opening a little bit wider. Few more words of exchange. Eventually, he caught a glimpse of the woman's face by mistake. Now, Shaitan started working on his mind. Now, you can't concentrate in ibadah. The man worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without difficulty for decades. Now he can't concentrate. He's in salah, but his mind is thinking of the face of the woman is coming and the waswasa is coming. Why? Now it comes time, he must go and greet the woman again. He goes down to the tower, he goes to greet. He goes again, he goes again. Eventually they start talking. Now it's face to face. Then eventually he started coming in the house just to sit at the table and just share a few words. Is everything okay? The woman fell pregnant. Allah. The Abid got caught and Shaitan didn't start by saying go and make zina. No. He got caught. 
He got caught slowly but surely, step by step. Shaitan started working his case eventually. It came to the point where he made zina with this sister of his two brothers. She was a chaste woman. He was a chaste man. He protected his rizza for decades. She falls pregnant. She gives birth to the child. The brothers are still on journey. What does he decide to do? He kills the woman and the child. And he buries them. And he comes up with a plan. So he says, no, when they come back, I will just tell them she fell ill and she passed away and I, and I buried it. So when they came back, obviously they were shocked. They started demanding answers. Something's not right. Nobody else knew about it. Nobody knew about the birth. Nobody knew about the death. The villagers were puzzled. The brothers knew something was up. They came to the man. They insisted that the Aad would tell them the truth. They threatened his life. And then he divulged the truth. So he's guilty of murder. Now it's time for his death to come. So they were about to kill this man. Shaitan appeared in front of the Aad. And said, I'll offer you a deal. Shaitan tells the man, You make one such death to me, and I will save you from the situation. I will help you. You have my words. Shaitan tells him, You have my word. Just make one such death to me, and I'll fix this problem. I'll sort all of these people out. You won't have to stress. And the man in that state, after his his fortress of the ibadah was broken and his yaqeen in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was broken. He was involved in so many sins subsequently, so deep into the situation, he prostrated to shaitan. He committed shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as soon as he lost his iman, shaitan absolved himself from that person and told him, you're on your own brother. You're on your own. And he died in the state of kufr. I can't exactly remember why I'm telling you the story. To be very honest with you, I have an infection and I took medication, so I am feeling very sleepy. But I hope there is some lesson in this incident. I hope there is some lesson in that incident, and we will continue now with uh, the hadith which Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam had taught the ummah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So here. The next one is a hadith which is in Sahih al-Bukhari where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that abstaining from evil is a form of charity. Abstaining from evil, abstaining from sin in its own is a form of sadaqah. And there are obviously many other aspects of, you know, ibadah that we can do as believers that falls into the category of, of sadaqah, that falls into the category of, of, of charity. Merely smiling, if you don't have money to physically give somebody, you can smile at them and inshallah that will be a form of sadaqah, a means of charity. So abstinence from, from evil. A person doesn't necessarily have to do a good deed, but merely not doing an evil deed is virtuous and a form of charity. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability that if we cannot increase in good deeds, at least that we do not sin. May Allah grant us the strength and the ability inshallah to do so. The next is a hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari and Muslim. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, What disease is deadlier than miserliness? What disease is deadlier than miserliness? So this is also uh, something to encourage us to understand that what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us, we necessarily do not deserve the bounties that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with. We know that there are people out there that are perhaps far better human beings than what we are. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests them, yet we are in a state of comfort and ease. So there isn't anything that we have as virtue over those people. So it is purely out of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we are enjoying these bounties. If Allah has given it to us and we are not deserving, what is stopping us from sharing a little bit of that bounty with someone else who is struggling? And as we feel sometimes this person doesn't deserve it, he's begging Astaghfirullah, doesn't he know he shouldn't be begging? We don't know the condition of those people. I was once, it was one night I was traveling on my way somewhere and there was a woman that was standing next to the road and she was asking for money. And she said, Wallahi, I don't like the position that I am in. 
I don't like to beg, I don't like to ask. I hate what I'm doing, but I don't have another choice. We'll say, ah, oh, but sister, did you go to so and so? And our mind is running with all the different choices that we perhaps think of that she has. But we don't know the condition of that woman. We don't know whether she doesn't have any other relatives left. She's only herself and her children that she's got to look after. Maybe she doesn't have parents. Maybe she doesn't have brothers. Who is readily just going to help her and her children today? So what disease is deadlier than miserliness? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the generosity of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There is another very beautiful hadith here. That this is a, a, a lesson for, for people who are in a position of authority, people that are in a position of leadership, that he who serves the people leads the people. He who serves the people leads the people. So this is, we can put this in the bracket of When a person does good to somebody else, you will notice that they will, they are obliged or they are, you know, at your service, so to speak. Please understand, we do not do good things for other people because we want something in exchange. Please do not do this. You are limiting your reward. You do good for someone else because, hey, you know, I know he's got a tire business, so I'm going to help him out now. Why? Because I need to change the tires on my car. So next month I'm going to pop in there and maybe he's going to give me a discount and sort my tires out for me. Maybe even for free. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink, brother. You remember I helped you that last time. Hey, help me out, Jamit. You destroyed all your reward. Because you didn't help that man because you wanted to help him for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You helped him so that you could help yourself. So who are you doing a favor? He who serves the people leads the people. When you start serving the people, you will notice you will be in a position where people actually take guidance from you. They take, uh, you know, you will have a, a level of, how do I say this, uh, loyalty. You will have the loyalty of the people. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to do that which is good. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant that those that are in positions of leadership also do so correctly. There is another very beautiful hadith here and we will end with this one. Where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, of all the good deeds, and it's just a reminder for ourselves, the reason why we are doing all of these ahadith is because we are discussing the eloquence of the teaching and the speech of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The fact that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's teachings were comprehensive. So they have listed a number of these hadith which are very beneficial. So the hadith that we will end off with today is that of all the good deeds, the quickest to be rewarded are acts of kindness and the keeping of family ties. Of all the good deeds, of all the good deeds, the quickest to be rewarded are acts of kindness and the keeping of family ties, maintaining of family relationships. And of all the sins, the quickest to be worthy of punishment are acts of injustice and the cutting of family ties. Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us tawfiq. And most of all, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspire us and bless us with the ability to follow the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Jazakum wa khair wa akhir wa awana and alhamdulillah Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah Amen Sad to announce that the late Gulzar Khan's wife has just passed away You must be seeing me moving up and down in the corner now uh, his, uh, their daughter, Rihanna Khan Parker, who is a, a lawyer and attorney as well, she, she's currently on all us, obviously she's texting me and phoning me. <laughs> uh, I have to be there, obviously. As you know, the late Guzar Khan was a counsellor, played a very important part in our life here. We ask Allah to grant her Jannah to Fiddhar and several to the family. Rihanna Khan Parker is one of the Children, so is Farid, so is Salim, so is Dr. Misri, and so is Mariam. These are all the children. 
you ask them to be on the Also, uh, Dr. Dickie Parker, the dentist down in College Road there, he landed up in hospital, he had a stroke at the clock of the brain, and they have removed it, and his speech is gone. I suppose he's temporarily not told to come back, inshallah. We ask Allah to grant him shifa, and so many of that are in whatever position Allah grant shifa, ya Allah, and grant our beloved that have passed away, grant him to not Also, those who have contributed, remember I said last week, we need some funds for the uh, for the batteries, about 14,000 rand. Thank you for contributing all the time. Also, the cameras that are, we're going to go live streaming in Shul, inshallah, probably in a couple of weeks' time. It's been coming on since late last year. So, we would appreciate your assistance for those, okay. these cameras as well, please. Thank you for those who have been contributing. Allah bless you. And I take it as an Israeli swap for your beloved one that has passed away. And our guests that are coming from all over the country and world, welcome and enjoy beautiful Cape Town. Thank you. We call it Medina to Cape Town Sharif.